So I'm on my way there. I'm almost out of gas. I have no, if I don't close this deal, I can't get home. I can't get back home. And I just remember the desperation of that moment where I said, God, if I, I don't even know how I'm going to put gas in my car to get back home. I'm all in, right? And so I closed the deal. The guy sold me the freaking house. I was only there for like five minutes before he signed my, what was called lease option memo at the time. And uh, he left. The potential buyer came through. I acted like I owned the joint. <laughs> I guess I kind of did. I was the owner of the contract, right? So I'm walking around like, yeah, check this out. Check this out. He's like, this is perfect. I said, did you bring your uh, down payment money? And he said, oh, yeah, we, we brought it with us. And the uh, guy hands me five grand in cash. And I was like, Whoa. holy crap. And for me, it was that money. Five grand cash. cash. <laughs> he brought to you. Brought to me. And so immediately I put gas in my car. Then I went and paid my mother in law back. You know, I said, honey, we got three grand left, you know, or whatever. What are we going to do? You know? All right, guys, here we go now. It is time to unlock more doors to deals. We're real estate investors here. We're real estate agents here. And we all have one thing in common. We believe that we can. We can live the life of our purpose. We can create financial freedom. We can build a better life for those that we love. And we can live the life of our dreams. I don't care if you're trying to do your first deal or your 500th this year. You can get to the next level. And we're here to help. Welcome to Doors to Deals. I'm your host and founder, Jim Manning. Today's episode can be found on doorstodeals.com slash 066. And today, ladies and gentlemen, today we have Jason Courtney on the line here. Uh, Jason is uh, a business partner of mine. He's a mentor of mine. He's impacted me um, uh, positively from a financial standpoint. Our business has grown uh, since we have partnered um, from a spiritual component. My faith has grown since I've been able to uh, pick his brain and, and learn things from him. And then just from an overall, uh, just a genuine, good person. And I am you know, blessed to have him uh, as a partner. And I'm also uh, feel blessed that uh, I got him on the show. Uh, he's going to share his story, some of the ups and downs that he's been through, and some of the amazing um, things that he's accomplished. And And there were parts when this episode, guys, got so good that I forgot I was even interviewing him. Uh, so he got going, and uh, there's just a tremendous amount of knowledge, a tremendous amount of uh, nuggets that he was sharing with us that I cannot wait for you to um, uh, to listen in on. And before we get going, a couple little housekeeping items. Um, uh, our big goal here is we're trying to help 250 people become financially free investing in real estate over the next 10 years. Last year, we were able to, I'm really proud of this. This is maybe the thing I'm most proud about. Uh, we're actually able to help uh, generate over $130,000 a month in passive income for our agents and our agents' clients uh, for right here investing in St. Louis real estate. So if you're interested in learning more about how we can help you build your passive income, contact us at deals at threedoors.com. Uh, to learn more. So just send us over an email at deals at three doors.com and uh, we'll go from there. And wholesalers, if you have anything available, we're, we're actively looking to buy right now. Send us uh, also send us an email at that same email address deals at three doors.com. All right, guys, no more talk from me. Here's the interview. All okay. right, guys, what's going on? I got Jason, Mr. Jason up, Courtney here. How are you, my friend? I'm great. I'm super excited to to be here and hopefully add some value to folks that are listening. So absolutely. So let's get started. Let's get started. Yeah. So this guy is a wealth of knowledge, a good buddy of mine. Um, I don't know. I want to just publicly acknowledge you just as a human being you are. I, oh. um, I know, I know this is going to get sappy Saint here, Jesus. guys. So <laughs> um, I was telling my wife the other day about you. I said, I think I'm legitimately a better person since we became friends. Oh man, that's so really I appreciate nice for you, you to say. Yeah, about as good of a compliment as I can can give somebody. So. Yeah, I wish I could give you the same compliment, but I think <laughs> I'm probably worse than I think. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> right on. So I, I generally am excited uh, every time I get to see you process through things that have to do with your business. It really is uh, impressive. Some of those people that are listening that understand. 
um, that know Jim probably don't get to see that, but it's a real honor to watch Jim work and, and how much he cares about everybody being successful. So anyway, yeah. that would be my compliment back to you. Oh, thank yeah, you. you. Just, I didn't realize we were going to do like a kumbaya moment here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome, yeah. but, uh, Thanks. I appreciate it. So, uh, so Jason, a little background on him. Uh, he's actually... We're in the process of becoming a, a business partners even with Jason because the guy is a master at lease purchases and creative financing. And uh, he's really just provided us with a tremendous amount of uh, value. So we're even exploring kind of like what that next level of the relationship is. Hopefully any day now we'll finalize terms with actually officially becoming business partners with them. And, and so I know you really well. Let's give... Um, Let's kind of just go into your story a little bit. Man. Yeah, like, so 20 um, years ago, yeah. a little over 20 years ago, I uh, got into real estate uh, for myself. My parents, or my father was a custom home builder. And so that's where my uh, real estate experience started. I was designing and um, uh, helping build custom homes for people. Uh, so the beauty of custom home building is that you're building the uh, every house you're building for the first time. So track builders build the same house over and over again and you get to add some features and some you know upgrades and stuff like that but custom building is so uh, unique and uh, because we're building somebody's dream came out of their head uh, wound up on paper and out is in real life right so i really enjoyed that that's where my <clears throat> i grew up pounding nails on crews for my dad's company but uh, it wasn't until um 2000 that I actually got into the business part of real estate um, more than just pounding nails. So yeah, so so when you were pounding nails, so it's it's funny. Like uh, I guess Ryan and I like to become business partners with people that work for their dad's construction companies. Because <laughs> Caleb's kind of the same way. He's, yeah, similar backgrounds. So like, take me into like the so you're kind of pounding nails and like like what was going on in your life? Like what was what was happening that made you want to get into real estate? Well, I think my dad kind of saw some things in me that were more valuable to him than me pounding nails because he could get a lot of people to do that back then. Not so much now, right? But, um, and he saw that I just cared about people and that I wanted to see people do well. And uh, he thought that I would be good at helping people get these dreams out of their head onto paper so that we could create a, a blueprint that we could execute on. So. He threw me on the sales floor um, and um, been history ever since. I became the top salesperson uh, the first six months. Um, I had sold twice as many properties as all six other salespeople combined, and he couldn't believe it. All right. So he was kind of like, my son, you know, <laughs> you know. Of course, all the other salespeople were pissed because they thought he was feeding me deals, you know. And, and so uh, what? Uh, so what was? What were you doing differently than what the other people were uh, to get more sales? Yeah, that's a really good point. And all I can tell you is I trusted my dad. So my dad put me at the Lake St. Louis office, um, and the Lake St. Louis office was on top of a bank. And so we didn't have any drive-by traffic that came in. <clears throat> so we had to book our appointments and we had to call, cold call and do all that kind of stuff. So uh, my dad says to me, I want you to go through the salesperson that I replaced. I want you to go through all of her files and call every single one of those people that we didn't build a house for, find out, find out why and try to set an appointment uh, for every day of the week <clears throat> that you're in the office. So I did that. And once I exhausted her files, uh, he said, open up the white pages and pick a letter. Just start calling people Whoa. and ask them if they ever thought about building wow. a custom home. So that's what I did because I didn't have anything else to do. And I booked an entire month every day, uh, multiple appointments per day. And I sold my first house in two weeks. Um, didn't know so what the heck I was doing. Like a mojo dialer or anything like that? Or were you just Back then, the there, was, there was no mojo dialers. That was 20 years ago. Right. So that was in 2000. And uh, I just literally opened up the white pages and picked W was the one I picked first because my middle name is William. So I just went through all the W's and called uh, people and said, hey, this is Jason with Home Source Custom Homes. Have you ever considered building a custom home? And, you know, I got rejected more than uh, I got, you know, to talk to people. But anyone that's done cold calling <clears throat> knows that old people like to talk because no one's called them in a while. Right? So you, <laughs> yeah. I got into a bunch of those conversations, but I was surprised at how many people said, yeah, I thought about it. I just didn't think I could afford it. 
And then I could get into my father's model, which was build custom for less. <clears throat> so building a custom home was extremely expensive. So what my dad did is he said, I want to be able to build a quality custom home for somebody for the same price they can go out and buy a track home for. And the way that he did that is he allowed the contractors or the customers to subcontract out the interior work. So they paid the plumber directly. They paid the electrician. There was no builder markup on it. So we were basically helping them with the design, um, doing the uh, getting all the engineering done, digging the hole, putting the foundation, in, erecting the shell, make it watertight. And then they were working with all the interior subs to cut out the middleman to keep cost down. And this program took off, you know, because to build a quality custom home costs almost a third more than a track home would cost that you build over and over again. So um, I would tell people, you know, yeah, you can totally build a custom home for the same price you can build a um, track home. And so that's how I generated leads. And then I would sit them down at my desk and my dad said, listen, they don't know what you don't know. So don't tell them, right? And just ask questions and listen to their answers and then call me. And so after the appointment, I'd say, dad, they said this, they said this. He said, okay, here's what you need to do. So I think for me, ignorance was bliss, right? So um, I was in Lake St. Louis with one other salesperson who was doing very well. And then the other four salespeople were uh, at the Arnold office. And so when I went to my very first sales meeting, <clears throat> um, everything I guess my dad had been telling these salespeople, they weren't doing, they weren't making the calls, they weren't putting the time in. <laughs> and so he used me as an example. And I'm sitting there thinking, what's going on here? I've never been in a sales meeting before, <laughs> you know? And my dad's like saying, here's what Jason did this week. And uh, no one could believe it. So that was like the beginning of <clears throat> my sales experience. And I learned something that ignorance is bliss, right? And if you just do what someone who knows more than you tells you to do, Again, and I knew my dad cared about me and wanted me to succeed. So it was easy for me to trust him. Um, so I think that was the why I did so well. What were the what were the other people doing? They were waiting for people to walk in the door, you know, they because the Arnold office, they had a big display. There's a big log cabin out there and a big uh, display home. People would drive by and just come in to build a custom home. And so they were just living on the walk-in traffic. Uh, and the walk-in traffic was far better than the traffic I was getting, but I was calling so many people that I was getting 10 times more appointments than these guys were because they weren't calling anyone. So, so you know, it's interesting, like, I mean, this is incredible, like whether you're flipping homes, wholesaling, doing these purchase deals, creative finance, like you name it. I mean, this is, um, this is so applicable, like it's like sales is sales, what, or whether you're selling electrical components or medical devices or whatnot. So like, there's a reason why I'm like really curious about like Jason's story and why he's been more successful at getting more sales, like when he was in this role compared to other people, uh, because like, that's something that we can learn and kind of utilize and, and, and put into our own business, regardless of what business that is. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think in every case where I've succeeded, there was some sort of um, uh, ignorance, maybe. Um, not ignorance, but uh, um, I didn't know what I didn't know. I was learning. And so I was trusting people that knew more than me. You know? Yeah, and you had that right mentor to kind of help you along the way too, didn't you? I tried to get into real estate when I left my family business on my own, and it wasn't until I hired a coach that uh, mentored me well to where I really succeeded. So, so um, I mean, you're, my brain's just kind of going off. Like you're able to just literally get the telephone book out and call W's. And, I mean, and. You know, it's interesting. Nowadays, the white pages is probably online, so you can well, yeah. still do it. Well, yeah, and like if you think about it, guys, like there's a lot of lead generation strategies out there. Like, hey, uh, use the text mass text blasting tools. I think you have one called Lead, lead Machine Pro. Yeah. Uh, there's Batch. There's Launch Control. There's a bunch of them out there. And like the, the thought process is, oh, okay, well, we'll get these lists of absentee owners or pre foreclosures or whatnot. And we'll kind of like target and blast out these lists. And um, those are much more targeted than what I was doing, <laughs> but yes. Yeah. yeah. And at the same time, like, 
person has a house, they might want to sell it. So literally, yeah. like, yeah, you can do this targeted approach, or you could just get a list of wherever you live, everybody in it, and then just start calling and or texting literally everybody. Yeah, I think there's definitely more uh, accurate ways to target who your audience is, right? But um, for me, I had nothing else to do, and I was on straight commission. So I'm thinking if I don't have somebody in front of me, I'm going to be on the phone. And so as soon as my appointment left, I would call my dad and tell him what happened. And then I would start pounding the phones again. The white pages sat on my desk for a year and a half and never left, never left the top of my desk. And that's where I generated all of my leads. We would also do home shows. Uh, we'd go there and my dad would have a display or whatever. So I would generate leads there too. And those were really good. Leads. Those are my favorite actually. But the white pages uh, made me a lot of money. And it's just all centered around talking to people. Which I like to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Except when they're not interested and they still want to talk. Then I kind of like, Ooh, how do I end this conversation without being around? <laughs> so one more time, the script that you use that I got you double the sales of what other people were doing. Hi, this is Jason with Home Source Custom Homes. Have you ever considered building a custom home? Okay, so hi, hi, this is Jim with Three Doors. Have you ever considered selling your house? Right. I mean, boom, there's a script and it can be that simple. You don't have to overthink it, guys. The key is, is the action and the numbers of getting in front of, like, do you, how many people were you calling? Do you remember? Oh, a lot. I probably called, and back then, people had home phones, right? So that you were ringing their home. And uh, so most of the time they were at work because if I was at work, they were at work. And so I'd leave messages and they'd call me back. You know, those were great because those that weren't interested at all, they don't bother to call you back, you know. But I think I said the same thing. I was so robotic, you know, that makes sense that afterwards I'd have to shake it off and go take a break. And um, But I bet I probably called per day 150 people. Maybe. Yeah, that's you manually ones. typing in all the yeah. numbers. And yeah. then saying the same I wish, you know what I really it. wish I would have done is saved the white pages I used because I crossed through them so I knew where I stopped, right? And I wish I would have saved that because now that I know about sales, I didn't know anything back then. That was the, my first experience of sales. Uh, those are things that I want to remember, you know? Like when I started my um, lease purchase the business, uh, I had no money. So I went, I couldn't afford bandit signs or anything, right? I bought this $297 course and built my entire business on that, right? Uh, but I went out to my backyard. I had a piece of plywood. So I had a saw and I cut my own stakes. I stole my daughter's poster board for uh, <laughs> her schoolwork and I wrote, you know, like a bandit sign. And I saved those stakes because I don't ever want to forget what it was like to be broke, you know, and, and have that drive. But I really wish I still had the white. All right, well, let's, yeah, let's dive more into your story then. Let's okay. keep going on. So, uh, so you're doing the whole building thing with your dad, sales were going good. And then what happened next? Well, the next thing that happened was my dad's like, this guy's a rock star. I'm going to make him the sales manager, which was a big mistake because I'm not great at managing people. Um, and I thought to myself, this is so easy. It's like taking candy from a baby. I can train anyone to do this. Like I was real cocky, you know, um, and I'm making more money than I ever made in my life. You know? um, <clears throat> so he puts me on the sales floor and I tried to train these people to sell the way I did. And that's impossible. Like you literally have to find out how people function and teach them to sell within their comfort zone, right? Because when you're uncomfortable, people know it. And so I didn't know that back then. And so I'm trying to change everybody and I just made everybody worse, you know? <laughs> and the sales for the company went down because here I was training people instead of uh, selling. And so that was kind of a mess. I'm like, dad, you gotta put me back on the you know, sales floor. I'm happier there, I was making more money there. And I think I'm doing a disservice. So that was the next thing that happened. Then 2008 came, right? <clears throat> and uh, construction industry and home building just went in the tank. As soon as we saw Lawless go, Lawless was like the riskiest track builder out there, right? So everybody watched Lawless. Like if something bad happened to them, it was coming down the pipe, right? <clears throat> and so at that time, I started studying, you know, what's going on in the market? Why is the market tanking? It was foreclosures. People had bought homes with no money down. And, uh, people who shouldn't have been buying homes to begin with were buying homes. And 
we're going into this uh, massive foreclosure. So I thought, okay, I got to stop foreclosure somehow. How do you stop a foreclosure, right? Yeah. So I started studying about that. I learned about loan modifications, short sales, blah, blah, blah. So I decided after the loan modification business was a total disaster and I couldn't make like any money really helping people do that, I started focusing on short sales. And that was phenomenal. So I ended up building a short sale negotiation company and uh, we were doing 50 to 70 deals at all times and we were making a ton of money. <clears throat> it became a feeder for my flipping business. So my partner and I flipped just over, uh, just under 300 houses uh, from 2009 to 2014. A hundred of those I did myself. Um, so I learned a lot about that part of the business. And what I really learned, what I really took away from that, <clears throat> two things. Flipping houses is a job. You know, I have to go out and keep flipping houses if I'm going to keep making money. Um, and I learned how the banks work, which was really important for me. And I, I didn't know the banks didn't want to foreclose on people. They were like forced to kind of, right? And if I could uh, figure out how to be the bank, because the bank always wins. I mean, they always win. Even when you think the bank just lost a bunch of money, forget about it because the FDIC and HUD comes in and bails them out, right? But <clears throat> the banks always seem to get their money somehow. Um, so learning how they worked really helped me think about, you know, later on, happened later on in my career. Um, when uh, the home source, my, my family business started to tank again, not because of 2008, because my dad was pretty much debt free. So they didn't have to build that many houses to stay afloat. Um, but they weren't doing well. <clears throat> so in 2014, they asked me to come back and help them. And I was like, man, I'm making a killing right now. I don't really want to go back there and do that. And so I said, listen, I'll move my office into your office and I'll help you sell some houses and get you guys back on your feet. So I did that. And for eight months, I went out and sold, uh, I don't know, 20, 30 houses for them. And then <clears throat> they got back on their feet. And then at that time, I had turned the general contracting of our flips over to a couple uh, who I won't name because some people might know them, uh, but they ended up ripping me off big time. <laughs> and so they tanked our flipping business. And so at that point, I was like, okay, uh, Home Source is doing good again. And I thought, all right, well, they're wanting me to partner with them. And I said, listen, I have no interest in being an employee for you so, guys anymore. So let's partner. go back. So we'll, so business is going good on the flips. Yes. And you brought in a partnership. I think we need to explore that a little bit more. I know you don't probably want to talk about it, but that's okay. There's probably some valuable lessons there that we can so well, so take me back to there like like when you started that uh, relationship, uh like like how'd you start like how'd you structure it? Well I knew I could still manage the short sale negotiation company, but I couldn't manage being on the jobs that we were flipping all the time. I couldn't just couldn't generally and still help uh, home source. So um, we hired, it was a couple, family, a husband and wife team to come in and do all the general contracting on the projects that I was in charge of. And we started losing money. So I started to see, you know, how much money we had in these properties and what we were able to sell them for. And, um, you know, nobody cares. It wasn't their money. It was writing checks. And, you know, I had one house, I'll give you an example, that they totally renovated. And when it was done, it looked like it needed to be completely updated because all the stuff they did was so out of date and old and it was just terrible. I'm like, this is updated, you know what I mean? And because I wasn't monitoring it and I just trust them, it's totally game all to My other partner whom I absolutely love, he just it wasn't much of a confronter. He would tell me, hey, something doesn't look right here. So I'd go talk to him and I'd say, yeah, you need to do this, this and this or our deal's off, you know? But I don't know if that answers your question. Do you think, Looking back, do you think they were just not as trained or not as competent as you thought? Like maybe they were the right person, but they nope, they were the wrong people. Period. Okay. And what about them ended up being the wrong person? They were dishonest. Okay. Um, and they had some of their own financial issues that um, I don't want to say forced them to steal from me, but they did. You know, their own for personal finances were in a total disaster, disarray. So, you know, they were writing checks to themselves and making it look like it went to a contractor and stuff like that. They were just the wrong people. Their ethical and moral fabric was uh, tainted by 
their lifestyle, I guess. I don't know what I'm saying. Okay. And then that, so that, so they crumbled the business within six months or how? It was a little longer than that. I want to say it was closer to eight to 10 months because I didn't catch it at first. I thought everything was going fine. Um, and quarterly, we would always look at the books so I could kind of tell when we were doing, when we were making half a million dollars a year that my partner and I were splitting, splitting, right? And all of a sudden we saw the numbers decline drastically. So at first I thought it was a shift in the market. I didn't think it was them, you know, but it turns out it was them. So I had to make a choice whether I rebuild that business or continue to help my family business at the time. It was the toughest time of my life right then. So watching my business crumble and it was all my fault. You know, my partner didn't really like to get people hired, you know, so I should have listened to him probably, but they had a lot of experience. So was there any red flags that looking back they displayed before you entered into that relationship that you were just just ignored? There probably was. I probably tried not to think about it, so I get right off the top of my head. I'm sure there was. I didn't really have any reservations about them, to be honest, but I didn't listen to my partner. That was a problem. You know, so my partner was more of a manager of the business and I was the rainmaker, right? And so even though we were 50% or 51, 49% owners, I kind of ran everything and he managed the business. So I don't think he felt like he had a strong enough voice maybe, uh, or even if he did, I may not have listened to him. So ultimately I'm the leader, right? It boils down and I blew it. So, so, um, so this is where knowing yourself is really important guys. <clears throat> so Jason is a uh, very optimistic. That's just in his DNA, he's a very positive, optimistic person. So having someone that Jason can trust that can think more pessimistically can be a, a really important thing, okay? Um, and then the additional thing, what I would say, just advice I'd give in general for people thinking about doing something like this is um, it's the same thing as you think about like a toddler, like you crawl, then you walk, and then you run, right? So like... Like if you're going to start to use leverage, a great way to do it is a 30, 60, 90, where you set up and you say, hey, uh, if we're going to enter into this agreement over the next 30 days, I need you to do X, Y, and Z. And you have to achieve that. And then I'm going to give you a little bit. Then in 60 days, I need you to, to, to do A, B, and C. And then 90 days, I need you to do this. And then and after each uh, month that goes by, you start to kind of extend the leash, extend the leash, extend the leash, and they do it through ownership, uh, or I'm sorry, they do it through results and through production that you're actually seeing. Uh, Jason, how you structured that, there's a reason why I know exactly what you did because I'm guilty of it. I, I did things the exact same way and I'm pretty positive too, where I would hire somebody and be like, okay, my problems are solved. I have leverage now and I would give them over the job and say, well, see you later. I'm going to go do this. And I wouldn't take the time, the extra time to pour into the person to really develop them and make sure they know exactly what success looks like and make sure that they are actually doing the activities. Right. That's so, exactly what happened. I just turned it over to him, totally trusted him that it was going to work out. And I didn't manage them. And I already knew I was a bad manager because Five years ago or six years ago, I blew it as a sales manager, right? So, well, and I don't know. And here's the thing that's interesting about that is like, if you have the right people, you don't have to like manage a crazy amount. You can lead. Okay. So if you get a self motivated self starter that's a really competent individual, yeah. um, that they're coming to you with stuff, um, you can really at that point, like they already have that intrinsic burning desire to do things at a really high level. Well, you always hear people say you got to hire eight players, right? And mm -hmm. so a couple of things I've learned is that uh, they're either an A player or they're not, right? And so we all want that self-starter. Um, however, I think that there you can, if you manage people well, they can become extremely productive, whether they're a... Uh, I don't want to say not an A player because they have to be an A player. At some point, they have to get to A player status, right? Or they're just uh, probably not the best. 
thing for the organization. But anyway, I don't know if we want to keep going. No, I, it's, it's, what, it's interesting. Yeah, we can get back to your I story. I sucked at it. I totally blew it. I hired the wrong people, and I didn't manage it. It was totally my fault. Okay. So, all right. So, that's so yeah. All right. Well, we'll yeah. keep going on that. But, but, yeah, this is a really interesting topic. And if you're going to leverage, just know that it's not a instantaneous leverage. You have to develop people. Yeah. And you have to spend the time in developing. Okay. I would totally agree. Okay. So uh, so then you went back to your family and oh, we got some chats as well. So then you got went to your family. And um, so what happened when you went back to home source and Hey there, if you're looking to get the ultimate edge for your real estate investing company, go to dorsadeals.com slash invest for more information. Just so you know, a high percentage of the people that we interview on this podcast are actually already Three Doors Network members. And our network members have a lot of extra resources. They have an access to an online training vault with over three years worth of content in it. They have access to vendor savings like our Home Depot discount uh, that's literally saved thousands of dollars for members. And uh, we have a weekly group coaching call and we have a lot of other great things as well as part of the, um, the Three Doors Network. So make sure that you check it out on doorstodeals.com slash invest. So what happened when you went back to home source and yeah, so uh, the cool thing about or the decision that I made to go back to home source was twofold. One, I wanted to help my family because I love them, you know, and I would do anything for them. Um, but th- they would always call me back to help them when there was a problem, and I'd dig them out of the hole, and then they'd get amnesia about how that happened, right? And so we always had this bit of conflict going on, and it bothered me deeply. I mean, I have to say, it bothered me so much. I can't think of anything that um, um, ripped me to the soul as much as that, because I thought they all know that how much value I add here, but for some reason they don't care. Right. And so I learned, you know, hindsight's 2020, right. <clears throat> but it was one of those things. It was the, to not move forward with the plan that we developed, which was my father, myself, and my brother being a third, a third, and a third owner. Um, and uh, taking the business to the next level, they decided to revert back to some old behaviors that I knew weren't going to work. My dad knew weren't going to work, but my brother and sister were kind of, um, I, don't, I don't know how to just say what they were doing, but they were, they wanted to take the company in a different direction. Oh, was it your sister or sister-in-law? Like sister. Sister. Yeah. Okay. Right. So who wasn't a third owner, right? And Carla and I get along very well now. But at the time, we didn't get along very well. My sister was kind of had this Louis Vuitton model is what I call it. And I had this Walmart model because my dad's business just started. The whole reason for his success is that he made custom home building affordable, right? Like Walmart. And so my sister's like, let's just build two or three houses and charge a premium. And I'm like, no, let's build as many houses as we can and try to save people money. Both models work, but they don't work well together. So we were always at odds, uh, her and I. And so one of the deals with me coming back, I said, listen, Carla has to be out, right? My sister can't be involved because her and I can't agree on business models. So I'm not saying hers won't work. I'm just saying that if you want me, you got to do my business model. And so... um, she agreed to basically back out. And then after we made this a third, a third, and a third agreement with my dad and brother, uh, my brother started pulling her back in. And so I said, Joe, you got to make a decision, you know, uh, what you're going to do here, because I have no, I, if I, if we got to do it this way, this way works, it's proven, we know what we're doing. Yeah, but I think if we do this, right. So I just said, you got to make a decision. He decided to go with my sister's uh, advice. And I said, okay, no problem. You know, I have this other business, I'm out, right? So, because I didn't want to fight with them anymore. You know, I already knew three times they called me back, right? I didn't call them. They asked me to help them. I dug them out of the hole every time. So I thought, okay, something's not right. It made no sense to me, right? And I remember sitting down with my daughter, who at the time was probably 23. And I said to her, I cannot believe this makes no sense whatsoever. I cannot believe this is happening. And she says to me, dad, just believe it. It's happening. <laughs> and I was like, out of the mouths of babes, right? So at that point I said, you know what? She's right. And my wife was like, listen, this is not a good thing. You need to leave the family business and go on your own and blah, blah, blah. 
In fact, the biggest mistakes I've made in my career, I didn't listen to my wife, right? So there's some, a lesson for some of you out there right now. Um, but so anyway, it had, here's what I believe. I believe that God had to make it so ridiculous. I wouldn't have left. I would have continued in that mess of a relationship, uh, family business type of mess because I loved them so much that it had to be so ridiculous that I had no choice to leave. You know what I mean? And it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. That's my story now. Right. So All I'm right. wealthier than I've ever been. I'm happier than I've ever been. And, uh, you know, God's just done some great things. Okay. Yeah. So let's get into, uh, the, I guess the next chapter, or which is still the existing chapter, so to speak. So, yeah. Uh, so you got out of that, and then you got into doing deals the way you're doing them now, right? So, yeah. So I'm sitting at my house. My brother and I had agreed to take a very small salary so that we could dump all the money back into the company to get it uh, up and running and make, just make it strong. So, um, I lost at that when I made that decision that the money was over. I had no more money coming in, and I was only bringing in enough money to pay the bills. So having a check for without a check for one week was a problem. Well, and and at this point, are you like 2015 or so short sales are pretty it much dried up now at this point, right? Yeah, they were still, yeah, they were drying up for sure. No question about it. Um, and what happened is they were getting easier to do, right? Every broker in town was throwing them at us because they didn't want to deal with them. So, you know, we got every short sale from most of the Berkshire Hathaway offices. They were prudential back then, but um ton from KW. And so the brokers would just say, call the Alpha Corp. They'll handle the transaction for you. And we'd let the agent get both sides, right? So we'd buy it and then we'd renovate it and flip it. I did forget one really cool thing that might be important to add here. Uh, my team got called down to Tampa, Florida to talk to the big banks. Uh, Chase, uh, Chase was there, US Bank, uh, Bank of America. There's about 10 of them. And they were trying to figure out what are we going to do, right? Because we're taking back all these properties. <clears throat> well, the biggest problem you and I know is that they were forcing uh, the offers to start with owner occupants, right? They wouldn't sell to us investors anymore because they wanted people to live in these houses. Well, the big problem with that is a owner occupant buys this house for 80 grand. Even if they put a hundred grand in it, if they don't move, that sale still shows up as 80 grand in a $200,000 subdivision, right? So they were hurting the market by selling these properties to owner occupants. Because what happens when you sell it to an investor is we're going to put a bunch of money and we're going to try to get top dollar. So if you really want to stabilizing bring the, neighborhoods, yeah. yes, if you really want to bring the economy back, Mr. Powers to be, start selling them to us because we're going to bring these subdivision backs. We're going to sell every one of them. We're not living in them. And we're going to start bringing people's values back. And so that was a huge pivotal moment. And that happened in 2000, end of 2011, early 2012. That's when we all started being able to buy them from the banks immediately again. So it was neat to Thanks be- to Jason Gordon. No, yeah, well, let me, let me qualify that. I wasn't even there. It was just my, to my coach was there with a couple oh, okay. of his people. So I say my team, but I got to hear all this, right? And be part of it and see what was coming. And so I would, when we're negotiating these short sales, we were able to reference this uh, uh, meeting and why they should sell to us, right? So anyway, that was a big deal. But so look, we're back to home source. Uh, things ended there. And then I bought this $297 course online on how to buy houses with none of my own money because I didn't have any money. And so I knew that I wanted to get into you know, uh, purchasing homes and buying and holding them. I had no idea what a lease option was or a lease purchase or anything like that. Um, but I learned it as an exit strategy after I had bought the houses. <clears throat> so there was two guys, Joe Crump is the guy's name that I bought the $297 course for, and then Marco Rebell. Um, who's another creative financing guy. So what I did is I took the pieces from Joe Crump's course that I really liked and thought I could pull off and the pieces from Marco Rebell's course and combined them. Um, and that's really was this match made in heaven that you know, created well for me. So, but it was tough getting there. I was scared to death to leave. I had a home office and I was afraid to leave there and tell my wife I hadn't closed a deal or that no money was coming in. So I was motivated by being broke. <clears throat> and the straw that broke the camel's back was my wife borrowed $180 from her mother to buy groceries. And I was like, how did this happen? 
just a year ago, making a half a million bucks, you know, things are going great. So you went from making a half a million dollars in a year to borrow 180 bucks from your mother-in-law. It felt like overnight. I mean, it was, it wasn't, but it certainly felt that way. You know what I mean? The decline was coming when the partnership was falling apart with my brother, but uh, it felt like it just, you know, when you have no money, there's some desperation that kicks in, you know, and I'm good under pressure. So it worked out for me. <laughs> yeah. All right. So you have the ball. So, so yeah, so you, so you're in this really tough spot and like, what, how did you feel during it? Hopeless, I think is probably a good word. Um, and when I bought this course, here's what they told me to do. Go talk to people and tell them to give you the deed to your house and you're not going to give them any money. And I thought, damn, why not buy this course? That's stupid. No one's going to do that. <laughs> you know, I should have bought the one that was more realistic. So I'm studying this stuff and I'm thinking, no one's going to give me the deed to their house. I got no friggin' money to give them. I'm broke. And, you know, what am I going to say, you know? And why does it benefit them? to do that. Right. And so I didn't have any money to buy another course. So I just dove into this thing and I went back to the whole white pages model. Right. And I just started doing what Joe Crump said. He said, get on the phone. We make money on the phone, start calling people. And I probably talked to a hundred people. Well, I talked to probably 20 people before I had a guy that would let me, everyone knew I didn't know what I was talking about at first. Right. So they're hanging up on me and blah, blah, blah. But eventually this guy let me come to his property, right? And so I was like, yes, finally, you know. <laughs> An appointment. <laughs> yeah. So I get to this guy's house. It was a rental property. And I'm sitting there trying to tell him, hey, here's what I'm going to do. Here's why you should give me the deed to this property, blah, blah. And he showed me the door in about 15 minutes, you know. So I was like, oh, that was so close, you know. Um, but that just deflated me even more. So I said to myself, this is never going to work. Um, why would anybody do this? And, but I had no options. So I, I probably would have given up then if I didn't, if I had some money or I could have went a different direction, but I'm glad I didn't because when I learned out what the benefits were for people who uh, needed to get rid of a home um, and that they were willing to allow me to turn them into an investor in some cases, um, and that I was going to manage the investment and they were going to benefit. So, all right. So, we, yeah, sorry. I go too fast. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so you're broke, you get excited, you get this appointment, doesn't work out, he shoes you away right away because you just botch it. Yeah. And you're feeling like dirt on the ground and like, how did you keep moving forward? I just think I really just didn't have any choice, you know. And I think my faith kept me grounded. Well, well, yeah, I mean you did have a choice, but you your mindset was that you didn't. Right. Yeah. So like you just okay, your faith. Okay, tell me more about that. Well, I would just pray and say, God, man, you got to show me this is going to work or show me it's not one of the two. And then uh, and I would pray that daily. And I remember uh, I was on my way to an appointment. So I did get a couple people to talk to me. I started learning, listening to their responses, what to say. I was trying to find the pain. You know, I was Sandler trained, so I knew the pain funnel. And so I was getting myself in a position where they thought I knew what I was doing. I still hadn't done a deal yet. And I was on my way to this guy's house, had him, sold him over the phone, had a potential buyer uh, going to meet me there at the house. So I was buying the house and selling it within an hour. So I, I got the guy to agree to sell it to me. And then I got this guy to show up and give me a down payment to move into the house at, on a lease purchase. So I'm on my way there. I'm almost out of gas. I have no, if I don't close this deal, I can't get home. I can't get back home. And I just remember the desperation of that moment where I said, God, if I, I don't even know how I'm going to put gas in my car to get back home. I'm all in, right? And so I closed the deal. The guy sold me the freaking house. I was only there for like five minutes before he signed my, what was called a lease option memo at the time. And uh, he left. The potential buyer came through. I acted like I owned the joint. <laughs> I, <walk around. laughs> I guess I kind of did. I was the owner of the contract, right? So I'm walking around like, yeah, check this out. Check this out. He's like, this is perfect. I said, did you bring your uh, down payment money? And he said, oh, yeah, we, we brought it with us. And a uh, guy hands me five grand in cash. And I was like, Whoa. 
holy crap and for me it was that Mine moment came cash and cash <laughs> he brought to you brought to me and so immediately i put gas in my car then i went and paid my mother-in-law back you know i said honey we got three grand left you know or whatever what are we gonna do you know and i can't believe it worked and so she was so supportive of me at that time because she saw this just completely demasculate me right and now I had, I was back. You know? <laughs> and so I'd say two weeks later, I closed two more deals. Then I started closing two to four deals a month. And I finally had enough money to hire Joe Crump as my actual, you know, it was 10 grand to be in his program. So I saved enough money to go hire Joe and got to meet him, went through his train. He could not believe that I had bought 14 properties on his $297 course because it was a feeder, right? It wasn't really designed to teach me the business. Um, so he makes me this spectacle of the buying event. Hey, here's Jason Courtney. Here's, here's what he's done, all with my two hundred ninety-seven dollar. Um, and, and to give context on that too, like uh, sounds like you had a little bit of divine intervention there. And I agree, hundred percent. And guys, when you work your tail off and develop the skills, like you had already had a lot of success in sales, like you had developed this foundation. To, that would allow you to take a two hundred ninety-seven dollar course and turn it into that result. It's not about the 297 course, it's about who you are as a person and the skills that you have, that you could take that and use that and put that into play, right? Yeah, I think something important to point out is I put the work in. I mean, I was afraid to come out of my office for one um, because I, what was I gonna say to my wife? You know, are we gonna make any money today? Probably not, I'm studying, I'm learning, you know? And so I was probably spending 60 hours a week in my office educating myself so that I knew what I was saying. And I had called so many people and I remembered why they hung up on me or why they called me a scam artist or whatever they were calling me, right? And I started to learn uh, from my mistakes quickly. So the, I put the work in, all I can tell you, you got it, you can't, it's not gonna happen overnight. But once I learned it, it was like taking candy from a baby. I couldn't believe these people were signing their houses over to me. I had people paying me to buy their house because they were upside down. So I made them bring the difference to closing. I mean, I was like, you know, I went from broke to $200,000 in my bank account in like an eight month period. And I was like, I couldn't believe it. I took a $40,000 down payment from somebody just because they wanted to give it to me. I was only asking for five. And they wanted their monthly payment lower. They said, if we put more money down, I was like, uh, I didn't learn that part yet. <laughs> I said, sure, yeah, give me the 40 grand, right? <laughs> and so that's when I hired uh, Joe to be my coach. And I, I flew out to uh, Indianapolis and got to meet him. So, so. <laughs> okay, so then fast forward um, to like the next three, four years. How, what's your portfolio look like? So I got to the place where I had financial freedom pretty quickly. And the reason for that is because I was broke, right? So my wife and I had already figured out how to get our expenses down really low. I think they were somewhere around 5,200 bucks a month or something like that. Maybe, maybe even less if I remember correctly. So I had $6,000 a month coming in in cash flow. So I thought to myself, and I had all this down payment money. So one of the big mistakes I made is I was living on the down payment money. So the first thing Joe Crump says to me when we meet and I share my business, I say, here's what I've done. He says, oh, man, you're set up to fail. And I said, what? What, what did I do wrong? I mean, I only you gave me this stupid course. You know, you, maybe you didn't tell me something, you know. Um, but I, uh, what if I had, make, I had never had any vacancies yet. Nobody had broke their lease or anything. And I didn't know if I was going to have to renovate the house. And, you know, I didn't, I wasn't really saving a whole lot of money. I'm spending it, paying off all the debt that we accumulated over that two-year period of our business failing and then, you know, carrying some debt with home source. But um, so he says, you got to create a nest egg of at least $30,000. So I've always kept 30, even to this day, I keep $30,000 of my operating expenses in case I have vacancies. But the most I've ever spent on a vacancy to date is about eight grand on uh, renovations. So I've never even come close to spending the 30, but I have it there just in case as a cushion. Yeah, it's just as a little safety nut. Yeah. So, but uh, what's happened, you know, a couple things, which we probably don't have time to go into all of them. Uh, in the process, my dad passed during that time. Uh, I put my business on hold, but I was so grateful that I had a business that had passive income in it because I got to take care of my dad for 18 months every day. And the money kept coming in. My bills kept getting paid, you know. And so the power and freedom that I 
didn't realize I was building, I guess, at the time. I experienced for 18 months of not having to work at all. But Joe Crump made this video of me, right? Hey, here's Jason Courtney. Here's what he did with a $295 course. And so that video goes viral and people start calling me. They're like finding me on Facebook and looking me up in the, you know, white pages. I'm just teasing me from where they come. Uh, <laughs> well, that, no, that's your strategy on how you've made it right. <laughs> the white pages. <laughs> So these people start calling me and asking me to coach them. And I was like, I don't know how to coach anybody. You know, I've never done that before. And I sucked as a sales manager. So I had all this limiting beliefs, right? So then I hired a coach to teach me how to coach. And uh, we all know that's Sean and Joe McC uh, McCall. So, uh, and then Joe McCall also had a lease. He has a lease option business. I like to call it a lease, ours is a lease purchase business, but um, we're not going to get into details of the difference there, but that's a big deal. And so Joe McCall and Sean McCloskey taught me how to coach. And then I started this coaching business. So my portfolio was paying the bills. So I didn't worry about that. I just started doing coaching. I was helping people uh, create financial freedom. And I got really passionate about seeing that happen. So then I joined LB and met you guys. Yeah. 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 And here we are today. We started. Now we're just saying. <laughs> just saying. I got seven chats here. Oh, man. So, oh, geez. Dialing for dollars is the comment on here from Scott. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, all right. So Cody is kind of talking about this. So taking care of dad for 18 months. So uh, yeah, are you okay if we just that. get like a little bit kind of the personal element on like, like going through the loss of your dad and kind of how that impact you and well, let's just go over that a little bit more. Yeah, that was actually a lot tougher than it felt, actually. So um, it wasn't a surprise because he was declining. So we knew eventually he was going to pass. But until he passed, I didn't realize how much I depended on him, you know, and how much I loved making that phone call to tell him. He, he loved hearing every time I closed the deal, right? It was so exciting to him. So, but the back, my dad and I had a horrible relationship growing up. He was alcoholic and abusive, workaholic, was very rarely home. So uh, I had a lot of resentment towards my father growing up, uh, but I always wanted to please him for whatever reason. I think that's kind of the power of fatherhood, if you will. <clears throat> and um, so one day I decided I'm going to confront him about all the stuff I'm holding against him. And so I took him out to lunch and I said, Dad, I need to know why you did this, why you did this, why you did this, why you did this. I had a list, man. And he didn't remember half of it because he was drunk, right? But <clears throat> he apologized for all of it. And, and was uh, he already sick at this point or was this? Before? No, this was before he got sick. Okay. But this is where our relationship started to turn. This was right when he put me on the sales floor. Because I'm like, I'm not sure I want to work for this a-hole. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I got to get these things straight before I make that jump with him. And so it couldn't have went better. Our relationship, He started my business or sales success really impacted our relationship because everything he'd been telling his salespeople to do wasn't they there was no proof in what he was saying was working so when i started doing what he said i was the proof that if you listen to bill you'll do well here right if you think you're going to sell on your own without listening to my dad sold more to date no one's ever broke the records that my dad produced in, in the sales floor he sold 99 houses in, in a year one time and the most i had ever sold i think was like 48 or something like that. So even I didn't reach the goals of the master, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, the he ended up getting sick later on and we already had this big falling out that we just went through. And, um, you know, he, I put my dad in a really difficult position because he had to choose between my sister and I. And that was a very difficult place for to put a father, right? I didn't realize that at the time I was thinking, dad, she's going to bury the frigging company. She's done it twice already. You keep calling me back to save them. This is a no brainer. You know what I mean? Like, why is it so hard? And it wasn't hard from a business perspective, but it was extremely difficult from a father, you know, kid's perspective. So anyway, he, and he knew that if I went out on my own, I'd be successful. You know, I didn't need the business, right? <laughs> so that's why he would get excited hearing about my business, you know, and every time I close it. And so we really connected there. Um, but when he got sick, um, you know, being able to uh, care for him instead of having to work, because at home source, my dad was like, we're like JC Penney's, we're always freaking open. We're working from nine to nine, you're working on the weekends. Like he was a, he was a workaholic, you know? 
Um, but that's how he produced. He, he worked. And so, um, you know, my dad's relationship and I started to get really, really good. And then when he got sick, it got even better. It was the best 18 months of my life. I mean, there's nothing worse than having to wipe your dad's ass, you know, change his diaper and stuff like that. That's horrible. But <clears throat> you kind of dismiss all that when you're, you're having these intimate talks that have nothing to do with work, right? So... Yes. Yeah, so, so then when he passed, how did that impact you? Well, it rocked everything, you know. So I felt like I was fine, but my productivity just tanked. <clears throat> and I think it I shouldn't say I think I know what it was. My wife said, you know, the reason I was so motivated to do well is because when I did well, I got uh, kudos from my dad, right, or recognition, uh, which I guess is what I was always looking for from him. And so when he was gone, I didn't have anyone to impress anymore. And so I just lost all desire to sell, to, you know, produce. And so I just got lazy and sat back and just rested on my portfolio. And, you know, I mean, you got to hear some of those talks in LB, but, and I really thought I was okay. Like I, I said, you know, this is, it's good. You know, I'm good. I'm fine. You know, and the first couple of months sucked, but after that I was fine, but it was literally a year and a half. Um, before I uh, realized that something was significantly wrong. And the way my business works, as you know, is people have the right to buy these houses. And so a couple of my houses were getting bought and I wasn't replacing them, you know? So um, you have tax issues, right? Because you got to, if you don't do a 1031, you're paying gains. My uh, cash flow went down. My business expenses were going up because I was trying to solve problems that were all in my head, right? So it was kind of a, a disaster, you know, but thank God for my portfolio is all I can say. Never filed bankruptcy, I've, you know, through all that stuff. I've never not paid my bills. Everything's been, by the grace of God, sustained. But it was tough. It was really, really tough. And, you know. So what's your, so your, your why was kind of pleasing your dad? And then when he's gone, like, how have you? I didn't know that, but it was. You know. So how has... What's your why now? Like, how have you shifted it? Well, one thing I've learned um, is that time is more valuable to me than money. Um, I'm really good at making money. I'm not great at managing it. So I decided if I'm going to stop making money and start focusing on my time, I should learn to better manage my money for one, right? So the last two years I've been on a quest there and, and doing really well. Um, and um, you know, our, our new partnership that we're working on right now is extremely exciting for me. And, and then I've shared this with you already, but the most exciting thing is to see my little business scale, right? Because I, I work out of a room. The, the whole appeal to my coaching program, to my business is that you can do a part time out of a room in your house, right? With a very low overhead. I don't have to spend 15 grand a month on marketing to do deals. I just, you know, get a bunch of free leads. But so to see my little bitty business that you can do out of your house, go to the level that three doors can take it is, is very exciting for me. And it gets me up every day, you know? So that answer your question? Yeah. Well, yeah. Great. To watch that's three doors take what, what I've kind of created on accident and turn it into this, you know, scalable model. Uh, I've never seen that happen before because I was in a family business my whole life. And it's at first I was really worried about it. And the more I see how it works, Ryan has saved me some sanity a lot because he always says, Jason, you got to slow down before you can speed up because I didn't see things happening. And I'm thinking systems suck, <laughs> you know, you got to take control of everything, you know, but that's just not true. You have to have the right people doing the right things in the right order. And once you get that done, then you can speed up. And so, yeah, with the right system. Yeah, and that's what we've seen. And so now I'm more excited than I've ever been about watching this happen. So, yeah, and that's really my pull too is to help other people become financially free. You know, and um, uh, yeah, we're aligned there. And and I think, guys, one thing I would tell you is like, if you're looking into partners, to you know, developing those relationships. Uh, a house divided cannot stand. And there was, if you if you really listen to Jason's story about home source and his family business, uh, they did not have even a 1% chance of keeping it together. 
and let, because they were divided on their visions and they were divided on what they wanted. Um, the only way that that possibly could have worked had they sat down and truly synced up as a uniform unit and wanted the same thing and believed in the same thing, then there was a shot at it. But, but until like you and your sister got on the same page, no, this is the business model and your dad and everybody and started getting along like that, there was no, no possibility. And, um, and in a family business, you don't have that wisdom right that you just shared you because you don't know anything other than what you're in right and so we i think there was a sense of we all needed to get aligned um there's too many chiefs you know now my brother runs the company all by himself and my brother's not really a chief but he's getting it done because he is the only one required to have a one to, and has right. to make the decision yeah. and whatnot yeah and and that's why it's what's exciting about us. Like we have the exact same, we want the same thing. You yes, know? Yeah. It's synced up. And we've taken a lot of time figuring it out and making sure we're synced up and together. And and um absolutely. So dude, thank you for your time. Yeah, I see it's Scott's been fantastic. A, a comment there. And uh yeah, I appreciate you saying that, Scott. I'm super happy to share my story if it helps anybody, you know. So all right, man. Well, that's a wrap for today. We're uh, at time. And um, uh, why don't we end with just, do you have like, if you have one piece of actionable advice for yourself five years ago, knowing with the journey that you just went from, I know exactly what that uh, What would it be? You can do one thing good, two things not so good, and three things not at all. Get focused and go for it. Be the best at whatever it is that you decide to do. When I started focusing on a rental portfolio that was passive and uh, uh, more lender focused, that's when everything changed for me. When I was trying to flip houses and do short sales and help your dad do this, help my dad, I couldn't keep it all together. And one of the best advice I ever got from my real estate coach was, uh, there's a hundred ways to make money in real estate, pick one and do it well. And I wish I would have taken that advice because I'm kind of the, the shirt that says squirrel on it. I think that was kind of made for me. Yeah, so, the, the not-do list is more important than the to-do list. And that's why yeah. a mission is so important. So you know how to say no, you know. Anyway, so that would be the advice. All right, guys. So that's a wrap on today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And don't forget, we have a lot of great resources for you available on our website, doors to deals.com. Uh, slash 066 was this particular episode. And also, uh, if you want some more information on the uh, passive income opportunities that we have available, uh, we've been generating over $130,000 a month in passive income uh, for people in our network. Uh, so happy to get you more information on that. All you have to do is just send us an email, deals at three doors.com. That's D E A L S at three doors.com. And we get you more information on, on how we're helping so many people out and, and can, can potentially help you as well uh, from a passive income standpoint. So, I mean, that's it. That's all I got for today. So go out, live your purpose, and above all else, go after your dreams. Till next time. Thanks for tuning into the show. For more episodes and resources that will unlock Doors to Deals, check out our website, doorstodeals.com.